Hello everyone and welcome to In the Know with Kat Bobino. Today my extra special guest is my good friend Dr. Lisa White from UC Berkeley and by way of UCSF. The Art. well I was at San Francisco. San Francisco State, State my bad. Yep, and State. with the Museum of Paleontology. Mm -hmm. So thank you and welcome to In the Know. My pleasure. Great to be here and looking forward to a chance to talk with you and share what I do. Yes. So, by the way, what do you do? What is your job title? What do I do? Okay, so my job title is Director of Education and Outreach mm -hmm. at the University of California Museum of Paleontology. So we're a research museum at UC Berkeley. We house millions of fossils um, on campus and at some off-site locations. As the Education Director, I'm responsible for making connections between the research that we do at the museum mm -hmm. and the broad public's interest in fossils and the history of life. So we have a very rich website. Uh, we have programs that show the application of fossils to oceanography, to field work, to questions about climate and global change. So it's a whole diversity of tasks that I'm responsible for, but I really enjoy what I do mm -hmm. and um, I enjoy working in a museum setting. Well, that's awesome. So Museum of Paleontology, just for the people who are watching sure. and may not know, what is paleontology? Okay, so paleontology is the study of past life. So uh, fossils typically are remains of organisms that you know, are more than tens of thousands of years old. Wow. So it's the deep time record of life. And, you know, we've got fossils that include the charismatic, you know, dinosaurs and large mammals. My research training actually is in microfossils. Microfossils. So small okay. fossils that are found in deep ocean sediments and fine grain sedimentary rocks. So I often laugh and joke that you know, I disappoint kids when they hear I'm a paleontologist because they think I study dinosaurs. <laughs> right. I'm like, no, I'm sorry. I like dinosaurs too, but there are other kinds of fossils. But yeah, but it's the deep time history and um, study of organisms that are very old. That's a good way of saying it. Deep time history, mm -hmm. you know. So right. sometimes people confuse paleontology with archaeology or anthropology. Right. And those are you know human connected. Remains and artifacts. Okay, we go much older, much today. much deeper, much mm -hmm. much older. Right. Okay. Well, as we all know, you know, sometimes getting into it is I like dinosaurs, and you're playing with the dinosaurs, and you read all the dinosaur books and all that stuff. But is that your past getting into paleontology? Right. Not at all. And when I share my experience in getting into paleontology and how I even became aware of the field, it was later than most paleontologists. So, you know, many, many paleontology, paleontologists, especially the ones that study dinosaurs, they'll tell you, oh, from the time I was six years old, you know, I knew I wanted to study this. I knew every dinosaur name, blah, 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 <laughs> that history. And that's all great, but I was like, I don't right. know. I was in like high school, college before I really realized what earth science was. So my pathway to paleontology came through studying geology and earth science. And okay. I was really interested in photography. As a high school student, my first major at San Francisco State University, that's where I was an undergraduate, was art and photography. So I loved Ansel Adams photographs. Oh, yes. I loved, you know, landscape photography, <clears throat> big nature photography. Right. You know, even though growing up in San Francisco, I was very much an urbanite. <laughs> I just loved um, the photography of landscapes and Ansel Adams. So I thought, oh, I would be, you know, the black female Ansel Adams. So I was going to do photography. And I took a geology class for a general education requirement. Uh -huh. So I thought, well, I should probably learn something about the landscape and nature if I would photograph it. And I just ended up falling in love with the subject, really connecting with it. I was fortunate to have an internship at the U.S. Geological Survey okay. in Lowe Park when I was an undergrad. And so with cohorts of other students, we were able to do field work and get all this great mentoring from professionals in geoscience. So that really opened the door to knowing more about the field. 
and it just appealed to my sense of adventure yes. and I don't know one thing leads to another and decide to continue on go to grad school and that's where I the interest in paleontology really increased okay yeah so the interest started actually after taking a general ed course right so not the traditional I already know I like science I'm taking right. all my science classes but it was photography Yes. But I kind of want to understand my photography a little bit more. Yep. Let me take geology. Yes. Let me give this time to say thank you to everyone who's already joined us on Facebook Live. DJ says she loves us both and hello. (laughs) So hey, DJ. (laughs) And uh, if anybody else is watching who might have a comment or a question, make sure you hit it below. I can see it and I can shout you out and say, hey, and thank you for joining us. So I don't think I even understood geology until like two years ago. Right. So, you know, my background's in biology Mm -hmm. and I've always liked the living organisms and what they're doing and understanding what's alive. Right. But when you think about it, when you think about paleontology and the Mm -hmm. study of that, Mm -hmm. it takes understanding that sometimes to really understand what's going on with life now. That's true. And so it feeds into it. Mm -hmm. So how do you feel about studying what's alive comparing to studying what's already passed well that's a great question and we do spend a lot of time these days as paleontologists really making the connection to modern animals and modern environments a lot of it is because in the environments the climate is changing so rapidly Uh you know because of human-induced climate change that we often use the past record of life and our knowledge of changes on geological timescales and shorter to inform us about what we can expect in the future. And so, you know, when we look at um, rates of extinction now uh-huh. and the kinds of stress stresses that many populations of plants and animals are under, uh, we feel we are as geoscientists and paleontologists that we're just as key to conversations about modern organisms, especially as it relates to their fate. Right. So there's a lot more connections now uh, between biologists and paleontologists and geologists. In fact, many paleontologists prefer to call themselves paleobiologists okay. because many of the questions that they ask and the kind of data they collect and the broad research questions that drive you know, their projects are focused on uh, how the animals lived when they were alive. You right. Know, they're millions of year old animals. We're very interested in reconstructing the environments from that time. So we have a lot to learn from modern environments. And, and I think when you make that connection for people, especially the general public, then it brings new light on just what geoscience and paleontology is and then that way it doesn't seem so archaic or right. literally stuck in the past it's, a <laughs> it's like no we do stuff like yeah. you know we inform how we think about animals today and everything and yeah so the more we can share just how broad and deep our field goes and all the ways we connect right with biologists and other scientists is great for the field absolutely mm-hmm. let me say and shout out uh Melissa, Mel, my roommate. Hey, Mel. Yes. Right. She says hi to a couple of STEM stars, so hey. (laughs) But, um, yeah, so geology and geosciences Mm -hmm. is very encompassing. Right. right? So, like, for me, I'm learning more and more about it ever Mm -hmm. since that we really started to connect and I've gotten a chance to learn. Um, And I wish that was something that was offered in my undergrad Mm -hmm. because I probably would have taken it even though I would have been like, oh, it's dirt. You know, it's dirt. (laughs) Soil sediment. Don't say dirt. (laughs) It's soil sediment, you know, not dirt. But it's so much more than what we consider when we think of geology or the study of Earth. You know, what are some of the things that people may not think about in geology that is under that umbrella? Right. Well, um, last year I accepted an opportunity to chair a diversity and inclusion advisory committee at the American Geophysical Union. Uh And within that organization, there are more than 60,000 members from dozens of countries. And the fields that are represented within AGU include 
space science, atmospheric science, oceanography, you know, traditional solid earth geology. And it's, um, it's always staggering to me just how many connected fields there right. are in the science and then all the ways that we brand the field. So when I was majoring in the discipline, it was like straight geology or what <laughs> I would call now traditional geology. So right. it's very rock focused. But now what you see in a lot of degree programs, especially for undergraduates, is the degree tends to be in earth science, which means it's typically more interdisciplinary. The right. student is likely to take biology or oceanography or atmospheric science. And so in an organization like AGU that is long recognized that we're so connected to right. these other fields that it's there's a lot of benefits to having us together in right. one single organization. And so we often like to say too, you, you know, you can just totally find your science in earth science. And it's gone so far beyond just the rock focused geology. Mm -hmm. And so even distinguishing between geology, which can be material focused, earth materials, to geoscience, which is more broadly encompassing so many fields that are connected to the earth. It's right. really opened the door to opportunities, I think, to partner and collaborate with yeah. others. You know, there is so much more to think about when it comes to geosciences, right. you know, and uh, what we're walking around on every day is so right. far encompassing. So, And you witnessed that firsthand when mm -hmm. we had the opportunity at the School of Rock yes. to... Uh, you know, go on these great coastal field trips in New Zealand and um, the whole benefit of using the record right. of rocks to, you know, <clears throat> understand what was going on in, you know, the past Earth, I think has a lot of value. Plus it's fun, right? Well, it, yes. <laughs> so yeah, in 2018, mm -hmm. both Lisa and I were able to travel to New Zealand right. and with the School of Rock and learn a lot more. It's for educators who are in geo, or educators who teach geosciences, or people in geosciences, mm -hmm. and learning more about it. And I got an opportunity to go, and I met people who studied volcanoes, people who studied icebergs, you know, and the formation of the islands of New Zealand, because mm -hmm. it's a volcano-based island, you know, they were showing us things that I would have walked by by myself, and I'm like, oh, that's a wall of rock. But they're like, no, look at that formation. Right. You can see lava float here. Or there was an separation here. And it, I was like, Psh, oh, yeah. <laughs> mind yes. blown. You know? So with our colleague who directs the program, we always say our goal is to blow people's mind. Mm -hmm. you know? With partnerships with the International Ocean Discovery Program, we're able to bring educators you know, to these great environments, have them out on ships and... Uh, enable them to make the connections firsthand with right. why studying past Earth and ocean history is so valuable. Because, yeah, you never forget those experiences, and then you're better able when you're teaching, whether you're in the classroom or outside, or sharing science like you do with the public, to have these examples. Yeah, I mean, my mind was blown. Like, yes. I'm gonna lie. Yes. I was like, I even said, I was like, I might take a geoscience class, See? and I get back, and I'm still... <laughs> right. Mission accomplished. You know, yeah. I'm still looking because right. I had an opportunity to go to school through my job, but then they were like, "No, you don't fit the perf the profile." Because mm -hmm. like, you know? yeah. I was ready to go. If you gonna pay for it, I'm gonna go. <laughs> but uh, Melissa said, "You know, mm -hmm. the answers to the future can be found in understanding the past." There you go. So you know, taking this opportunity to look into things mm -hmm. that we may not have thought about. Right. That's under our feet consistently. Right. Yeah. Understanding that is key. Right. And when I was a professor at San Francisco State University, so I was on the faculty in the geosciences and um, earth and climate science department for 22 years mm -hmm. before I came to Berkeley in 2012. And in uh, many of the courses I taught, in fact, the courses that I had as an undergraduate, uh, I taught some of them, you know, as a faculty member. Wow. Back as faculty. Mm -hmm. And there are just some fundamental principles of geoscience that you want to make sure students understand as they go on in the field. And so the present is the key to the past and, yes. you know, just some really firm, um, you know, rules about how the earth operates. 
are really fundamental to just building understanding that, you know, you can't really figure out Earth history unless you're able to observe, you know, some of the things happening on Earth today. Yes, and from that trip, I really was like, let me keep my my eyes open Mm -hmm. to what I'm seeing now when I walk around. And it's like, there was, uh, I forgot what it was called when we went to, but it was a very high mountain. But then you can see uh, seashells in the rock. Right. And so you're at this top of this mountain, like right. that we drove because we wasn't right. walking up that mountain. It was right. young, but we, right. we drove as far as high as we could go. Mm-hmm. But um, but then you see it, you see and you it. see seashells, right. and you're like, so this that we're standing on right, right. now used to be underwater, right? And it's like I would have bypassed that before oh, this trip. You. Well, um, one of the projects that we have at the museum involves the curation of fossils that have been in our collections for decades. Uh, We've also inherited some collections from other museums that no longer exist. But part of the connection I try to make with the public is where those fossils are from. And Mm -hmm. so we have a whole suite of um, invertebrate shells, fossils from the Central Valley, like Fresno County, Mm -hmm. these places that are bone dry now. You know, you would never think of that area as being underwater. So we always make the point that, um, that, you know, the environment has been different in the past, and we know because of the shells that we find, you know, right. in these rocks. And yeah, the shells are found in rocks that are now on hills. <laughs> and so through virtual field experiences, mm-hmm. uh, we're able to show people like where these fossil locations are and how geologists and paleontologists go collect their data and, you know, and why it's valuable and what we do with that information. And yeah, and, and just that um, very you know, simple point of shells and rocks that are found you know, high above the ocean are evidence that the right. area used to be underwater if, uh, if we understand those organisms you know, are marine and right. lived underwater. So right. it's yeah, really powerful. It yeah. was, it, it was very powerful and I, implore anyone who either is in school, going to school, or you have kids about to go to school, to look into the geosciences and look more into your area. Right, and visit the museum's website. Mm -hmm. The web address is ucmp.berkeley.edu, or people can just Google Museum of Paleontology at Berkeley and Mm -hmm. see all of the rich resources that we have online. It's a lot, and mm-hmm. you'll see it because when you go into the building, there's a big Tyrannosaurus Rex right? too. And Fossil. we do have, you know, a modest amount of displays <laughs> in the building and the Valley Life Sciences building at Berkeley. But uh, yeah, there's all sorts of ways to engage with the subject. Right. Mel says uh, you don't get biodiversity without geodiversity. So understanding right. both provides a greater understanding. That's true. That is so very true. And that's another area of science that guides a lot of what we do, Mm -hmm. is just being able to document populations of organisms, both now and in the past. And, you know, biodiversity is really tied to the variety of environments that we have on Earth. And so understanding those geological environments or even modern environments and the range is, yeah, very much key and very connected. I remember at one point you were saying that you would um, maybe do a walking tour of San Francisco. Oh, yeah. So I, um, you know, I love my city. Mm-hmm. So I'm very much rooted in the place. And I think about, uh, you know, jobs, efforts, things I might want to do in retirement or, you know, post UCMP career, even though that's not coming anytime soon. But I think, you know, once you're a scientist who works in a museum, you're so committed to people knowing the history of an area. Right. I'm like, oh, I got to transfer this, you know, to my hometown. And I just, and I've been on my share of just San Francisco tours, you know, when people right. are in town or if they want to do touristy stuff, I'm like, I'm always game. So I go out and I think, I could be doing that. I tell a better story because I could connect you could. it. You know, yes. And then I talk about, you know, what I know or remember from when I was growing up. So I think the ability to just, again, share what we know about a place, yes. whether it's historical, um, you know, or deep time, 
just has a lot of value for people and you can make it fun and interesting you know i'm waiting so. for you to do it okay Thank i you. want to I go on this okay. walking okay. Okay. <laughs> I know. we can do one anyway we, yeah. we can <laughs> maybe we'll do a facebook yeah. live walking tour and there's right also now. some great geological guides of san francisco in fact during the American Geophysical Union meeting last year, it was the centennial mm. um, recognition of the organization. So okay. it's been around for that long, 100 years. And there uh, was a new version of a guide about the local geology that's been renovated. And so it inspired me to just want to do more trips, you know, in the city and in the bay. I have this, uh, I don't know if it's a question or a comment, okay. but kind of long. So okay. bear with me. This All is. Right. My cousin, Greg. Okay. Shout out to my cuz. Um, he says, so I have a question. Yeah. When I was about eight to 10 years old, your mm-hmm. mother, my mom, mm-hmm. bought me a microscope for Christmas complete yeah. with frog and instruments to open the frog up and study mm-hmm. the organs to put under the microscope. Mm-hmm. Now that I'm thinking about it, we never did any type of these type of experiments till I got to college. I loved that microscope and kept it until I got out of college. Okay. To make a long story short, mm-hmm. is there any way to have these type of studies for grammar school kids? Because it sounds like you don't get into these type of studies until you're in college. Right. Other than your mother, we never had the opportunity to study paleontology. Oh, Okay, shout out to my mom. Yes. <laughs> right. Well, it's so that is a story that's like all too true and common in a lot Very. of places. Like kids love examining any kind of object. I mean, mm-hmm. if you put something under a microscope, again, it'll blow your mind. Yeah. And what I um well what I'm inspired by is there are more kits that are less expensive. Right. There are microscopes that you can take out in the field that don't require the you know, foldscope. Oh, and the fold scope, mm-hmm. right? And um it, so I think students now and young people, kids in different kinds of programs have opportunities to examine things um, while they're, you know, out in the park or in nature. And, uh, but, you know, as we know, many schools are under-resourced uh-huh. or they may not have the right kinds of educators or teachers that uh-huh. are, you know, guiding what's going on in the classroom. So I just, when I can, you know, try to partner and do programs for you. Right. And, and since my training is in micropaleontology, I just, I love when people get excited about looking under a microscope. Yeah. And I mean, and you know from our time with School of Rock and yes, being and able to visit all the labs. <laughs> yeah. So we were able to, um, you know, do a sort of workflow and core flow, as we call it, on the ship mm-hmm. that introduced uh, all the participants in School of Rock to what actually happens when a core from the deep ocean comes up right. to the ship. So, you know, yeah. we examine it for the earth materials, we look at its physical properties, we look at the fossils in the material that requires looking under a microscope. So yeah, I just I sincerely feel that the ability to examine things under a microscope is such an important gateway yes. for youth into science. I'm I am definitely one person who feels like, you know, as a parent if you're a parent mm-hmm. To buying your kid a microscope. Like, my mom bought my cousin a microscope, and she bought me a microscope as well. Okay. But, you know, go ahead, and they're they're not that expensive. And right. getting a microscope for the house, mm-hmm. but also using it with them, you right. know. So, not you can let them go off on their own, but maybe use it with them. Sure. And, you know, let and talk about it. That's Even right. if you don't know the vocabulary, right. it's just, hey, let's see what a frog looks like under a microscope. Right. Let's see what this rock yeah. looks like. Or even your hand. Or your, you know? yeah, your, yeah, your finger. And people yeah. are just it's like, ooh, look at all those lines. Right. You know, or look at sand. Yeah. You know, yeah. how sand looks yes. like glass when you Love it. get yeah. it under a microscope. Right. But just opening that gateway at home, we can't mm-hmm. expect our teachers to know it all right. and to teach it all to our kids. So it's right. key to start it at home too and mm-hmm. just be like, hey, this is an opportunity and because we have social media and because we have Google now, Mm -hmm. you know, if you're ever looking for a project to do at home, there's so many at home projects you can do. Right. And there's so many resources you can find. That's true. You know how many scientists are on Twitter? You know? Oh yeah. And And just talk to and TED Talks. Yeah. You know, just on YouTube students really sharing or professional sharing mm-hmm. what it is that they're working on it's so educational informative yeah, yeah. and uh, so mel says she likes doing walking tours through sydney and looking at yeah. the geo- geology used in buildings oh yeah many buildings. even contain fossils right 
Yeah, yeah, I once did. This is early in my geology training, and I was still an undergraduate. It was my first trip to Washington, D.C., and actually it was for a black geoscientist conference. Mm -hmm. But there was a field trip option that was a walking tour of many of the monuments and buildings in D.C., and focused on the building stones, right. like all the limestone. And it's a great way. Urban geology just, you know, inform people about what the rocks are that make up these amazing buildings. Yeah, I think my first geology lesson was from um, the Magic School Bus. Oh. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> probably, everybody remembers, right? <laughs> that's probably my first yeah. introduction into geology was actually the Magic School Bus. Okay. You know? Magic School Bus goes into the earth. So, I you know. know. Hey, well, I loved as a kid, um, even though I wasn't a super science fiction nerd, you know, there were some things that I did really love. And the Journey to the Center of the Earth movie, yes. you know, it said, yeah. okay, that was the movie. Yes. When it comes on now, I'm like, oh, stuff so fake. And, oh, and my it, God. But it was so fun. And it just being able to travel, time travel, and then go back. And so, yeah, it's like, they're, yeah, it's a fun way to really think about. Science. Yeah, my little cousin says, Hey, lady. So, hey, thanks again for watching. But, um, yes. mail again. She yeah, said, Microscopes are a great way to encourage the public to mm -hmm. something they already know, like mm -hmm. sand from different beaches, yes. to and to realize how different they can be right. and to get them to wonder how and why. And that reminds me because when we were in New Zealand, yes. they have black sand beaches mm -hmm. and the sand was magnetic on some of the beaches, right? right. Which I thought, Yes, and that's amazing. That's amazing, but sand reflects what the local rocks are that erode, and there are a lot of volcanic rocks, mm -hmm. you know, all over New Zealand, especially in Auckland, which is basically volcanic rocks. And so, yeah, main mineral magnetite that yes. makes up those rocks. Yes, yeah, so I know. We were walking around with right. our magnets, right, right, right around, around like, all like, like, magnets, like, oh, like oh, what? Oh, the right. sand is following yeah, me on this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was great. And Mel says she'll be quiet now, and oh. we should just drink up. But no, don't be quiet, know, Mel. Yeah. Keep keep going. Yeah, what you're right. saying is amazing. I know. Amazing. And Kat surprised me with. I'm like, oh, we're gonna have yeah. a little. You we know, we was good. changing this up like, this week, uh, right? Well, <laughs> we don't often get it um, enough time to right. chat, and so might as well. I'm have thinking some about wine. it, like loosen up my guests <laughs> that come in with a little bit of wine. See what she did. I was being all serious, <laughs> like, hey, it. it's like, did. Was I supposed to study some questions or something? Like, no, no, you just gotta be yourself, chat. and yes. this is a chat. You know, they always, um, I always hear the new term. I don't know how new it is. But the new okay. term I've been hearing a lot is fireside chats. Oh, so this okay. is like wind down yeah. Wednesday chats. There you, know? you go. This is there. just a right conversation. Yes. We just talking about science. Right. Okay. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay. So one of the things that I learned about mm -hmm. geology or mm -hmm. geosciences. Yeah. There's not a lot of red tape when it comes to studying or traveling to mm -hmm. study your specimens because in biology, you're studying mm -hmm. something that's alive. Right. The higher you go on what they, I guess, consider the animal chain, okay. the more red tape it is. Okay. So, like, if you want to study insects, right. they're like, fine, it's like a million of those, mm -hmm. go out and study it. Then you go up to, like, maybe snakes, they're like, okay, it's less than that. We're going to, yeah. you can only study, like, 15 snakes, you know? But then you get to the mammals, and if it's nothing, if it's a rat, they're like, cool, it's plenty of those. But you get up to like deer or or you get up to cheetahs, they're like, okay, well, it's those are dying. Right. So endangered. they're endangered. Right. So right. your red tape is very thick now, right. and we're not going to let you study too many. <laughs> but in geology or geosciences mm -hmm. and paleontology, it's already gone. It's dead or it's, it's earth. Right. So you don't have as much red tape. But it does depend because some fossils are more rare than others. Mm. And, of course, the dinosaur paleontologists, you know, there's a lot of competition. Right. What kinds of fossils they study. And not all areas are, like, free to collect. There's a lot of fossils on private land and mm. even the public land spaces. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to request special permission. And in the case of my specialty, the small fossils I study... Well, you, you've seen and you know when we're out on these ships and mm -hmm. we have the material from the deep ocean and, you know, we process the what are essentially mud rocks, but uh, then we isolate the small fossils. So think about what those small fossils might look like in a vial. So I've had the experience where I've taken some samples in my carry-on 
and they're all in a little vial, and your TSA looks suspicious. Like, what is this? Because it's like yeah, this little, little white girl. Yeah. Like, oh no, let me. So you know, we just sort of travel with a description of what we have. So yeah, we totally recognize that uh, there are plenty of benefits, mm-hmm. you know, to studying um, the kinds of materials and specimens that we do that may right. not have the same, you know, kinds of requirements. But believe me, you know, there are a lot of hoops <laughs> to jump through. Uh, because of the areas where the ah, fossils will be found and yes. whose land it's on and um, just, yeah, the competition for it in so some, I, yeah, particular some. fossils and species that are so rare. Right. And everybody you know, sort of goes after them. So, you know, we just take that with what we do and accept it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that was a perfect time for Steve. Steve said, mm-hmm. wine, yes, crack rocks, no. So, yeah. I mean... We, we talking about rocks, not yeah, crap yes. rocks. You know, yes. <laughs> that doesn't come into this play, you know. <laughs> oh, do you? I'm guessing mail means do okay. you or do you know of laws regarding meteorites collecting and selling? I don't know details of, but I would assume you know, given the rarity of mm-hmm. meteorites and you know the precious category that they fall under that there must be some regulations but but there's so many just like underground trading that it's just mm, so frustrating yes with fossils the society for vertebrate paleontology they've got some guidelines that really help shape you know the way that the society members interact with amateur hmm. paleontologists and also with you know the buyers and sellers and mm-hmm. there's a lot of really unethical stuff that goes on really? people try to trade and sell yeah fossils so yeah. it's a whole you know, like, discipline in itself I, I guess i can see that you know oh yeah because there's a lot of money to be made you know, hmm. people have fake materials that they claim <laughs> you know they made they found a yeah, tooth like, right it's, like no it's no that's that's right. so interesting. I like, I guess I never thought about it, but mm-hmm. it probably mm-hmm. too depends on whose land it landed on. Mm-hmm. You know, it could be a private mm-hmm. farmer who doesn't no, want people right. on their land right. to collect right. this meteorite. Yeah. So, well, speaking of farms, remember the area that we stayed in New Zealand, that farm area that took like five hours to get there. <laughs> yeah. Once we arrived, it was so beautiful. It was the dark night sky. The Southern Cross was out. Mm-hmm. And constellations, you know, we're less familiar with, but. It's, yeah, so a good memory from that trip. Yes, so we stayed at an Airbnb right. on a farm right. on top of a mountain. And when I say on top of a mountain, that I mean where there's a it's couple remote. of houses at the bottom. Right. It took an hour to drive up to that. Right. To from, the. From like the split in the road. I mean, right. the directions were good. They were. It just felt like forever, though. It, and then get... it was, they didn't meet us. You know, yeah, the gate was said, just open. It was like, right. follow the red arrow. Right. That's all. That was the only direction. Yes. Follow the red arrow. And so we're driving and there's sheep running right. around, you know, just we're running like, back. Where is this and place? It shouldn't be taking this long. The Who door was unlocked. This? Yeah, no, you know right. what I'm saying? The door <laughs> was just rain. unlocked. Right. There was like nothing around. Mm-hmm. And it was, you cold. know, it was winter time in New Zealand. We had, a, we had an urban black moment where we're like, um, we are two black women. <laughs> In the middle of nowhere, <laughs> with a door that doesn't lock, right. on a farm where we haven't met the host. Right. Like, do we stay here or do we try to? Find right. Because some... we were booked for three nights, or said we're like we might be up out of here. Right. We was like, do we find a yeah. hotel? And even the drive up, I was like, okay, if something happens, because remember I was stressing, right. I was out of gas. I'm like, we're not in the state, so I don't have to worry so much. Yeah. If we break down, somebody doing something crazy right but still it's like you felt really vulnerable but at the same time we're like look we're here right and clearly this and it was a farm house so yeah. the bathroom wasn't in the where we slept you had to go outside and around to the bathroom so we we sat in the car for a second like uh <laughs> do we, we do spend this? all this time <laughs> But it was a great it was place, great. a beautiful, and then the stars yes. were worth it. Yeah, and then just yeah, yeah, the because general. there was yes. no other houses around and no other right. nothing else around. Oh yeah, it was a it great was... experience. New Zealand, yeah, our first night in that right. area. Yeah. It was just open sky. Mm-hmm. You just go out and see it. It was beautiful. Mm-hmm. I would I would recommend that Airbnb to anybody because we came home one day, home one day, but we Go came back, back one the... day mm-hmm. after doing some sightseeing right. and there was fresh eggs 
They, you know, our luggage was there. Computers were there. Yeah, just... And they just came in and just bought some eggs and left. We never right. met the hoe. The yeah. three days we were... So Kat made bacon and egg. Let me I just did. go on the... Re- <laughs> Y'all, if you Streaky know me... bacon. Yes. Right. If you know me, right. I gotta have breakfast. I like, okay, I guess we have... And even the next day, I was like, oh, we can still smell the bacon and eggs. <laughs> Well, that's the thing is, so I, the but valuable we lesson I learned when we were there, we were like, yeah. we gonna make the right. Valuable lesson I learned was over there, bacon is Canadian bacon. If you want what we call bacon, it's called streaky bacon. So I had to find it in the store. You but did. I was like, and I did, I found you it. Did. Oh, yeah. I found my bacon. You found the streaky bacon. But, um, fresh eggs. Yeah, and fresh eggs. Right. But it was such a great place to stay. Yes. You know, amazing. Yes, I know. Um, I would definitely right. promote it and be like, right. if you want somewhere to stay right. in, on the North Island, let me tell you. Because yes. at night, the sky is mm-hmm. amazing. And I learned how to make a fire. I was now. I don't think I've ever made a fire. And I, I was like, it's cold. And the wood was damp. It was cold, but you were determined. And then we had a nice fire because uh-huh. I was like, I'll just put on an extra layer. You know, I was like, no, that. we're gonna. <laughs> there's wood here. We are gonna have right, a fire. Right. It is cold. Right. <laughs> um. So my cousin Greg, <clears throat> how do you decide what you're going to study when it comes to fossilized plants or animals? Okay. Do you just find something that looks different and cool and decide to study it, or is there some type of method used to to determine what you're going to study do you just throw what you like wait do you just throw what you find like i did when i was a kid all right all right all right well uh most of us specialize so once you receive your training in paleontology if your specialty like me is microfossils or maybe it's fossil plants or invertebrates or dinosaurs then you know that's your groove and as you specialize in that field or that fossil, you know the areas where you need to focus in terms of geographic areas. You know, there's certain ages of rocks that are exposed in different areas of the world. And so if you focus on, you know, 30 million year old, you know, fossil snails, then you're going to go to those areas yes, in that- the world that have, yeah. So, it's, I mean, we, we're still surprised, and sometimes when I go to an area that I want to focus on a particular fossil, I might find something else, which is fine. That might lead to a new collaboration with someone or, you know, an unexpected opportunity. But yeah, for the most part, you know, as we specialize, we kind of stick with what we know in right. the areas that we study. Not to say that we're only limited to a certain geographic area. And that's what I love so much about earth science. I mean, we truly work all over the world and we collaborate yes. internationally all the time. You know, rocks we find over here, we have, you know, <laughs> equivalents over there. But you'll find that most paleontologists um, do focus on a certain interval of time and okay. a certain fossil. Yeah. What was the fossil that you focused on when mm. you were studying for your PhD? Right. So I focused on single celled plants. Um, called diatoms that have a shell made of um, silica. Mm-hmm. So you find them actually, they're very abundant in rocks in California. So there's a certain formation that's named for uh, outcrops that we find in Monterey County that okay. extends well north and south of there. But um, one of my challenges as a graduate student was to try to provide uh, better ages for that rock unit in California because some parts of that unit are so altered because they've been buried, you know, under deep um, earth processes and everything that sometimes the fossils aren't as well preserved. Mm -hmm. So I'd actually go to the parts of the formation where the fossils weren't as well preserved and try to extract them. So yeah, they're they're called diatoms and they're just a single cell plant that's very important today actually in the world's yeah. oceans mm-hmm. for the base of food chains yep. and there are many you know modern just biologists that study mm-hmm. the same organism so it has lots of cool and important applications but yes yeah, so I was focused on just you know the microscopic end of fossils but I like to think of myself as more of a generalist now I mean working in yeah. a museum with all different kinds of you know specialists that work there and the suite of fossils that we have you know i dibble and dabble <laughs> and plus being a professor all those years and right teaching about you know earth science and general paleontology i think prepared me well okay yeah because 
<clears throat> diatoms still exist. They're they still out absolutely. there. They, you know, they're yeah, still important in the world's ocean. Living and dying. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Masses. Living and dying, leaving their shells. Yep. The body. Right. You know, <laughs> right. and but they're very sensitive indicators of climate change too. Right. So they're the focus of a lot of modern studies. Yeah, right. To try to detail what's going on. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. with your study, mm-hmm. how many places have you traveled? How many countries have you well, traveled? I think my country count is around 35. So I've been to just as many countries as U.S. states. So actually, yeah, because I'm a little behind on state count. I'm yeah. like, ooh, that, I mean, that's not a bad thing. No, you know, no. More countries. Yeah. Then, um, but yeah, this year I'll be going to Austria uh, and to Brazil. I've been there before, back to Egypt. I've been there before too, so I mean, oh, what are you going to just, Egypt for? I'm um, just a good friend okay. uh, with her family. Yep, she's Egyptian American, mm-hmm. so going with her family. But in terms of our uh, research trips, you know, my first uh, research trip internationally as a graduate student was to Israel, mm. and I also went to Egypt that year. So it's my first introduction to Egypt. I did a lot of Pacific Rim travel as a graduate student, young professional, because the kinds of Fossils that I study in rocks are found around the Pacific Rim. So, you know, Japan, China, Korea, actually, the far east of Russia. Wow. And then on our side of the Pacific, just in Central America. So Costa Rica and Guatemala, Panama. Right. And then, yeah, areas of Europe, Western Europe, and even, yeah, Middle East. So and that's I love that book. Basically and paid a, for. I know. Paid so for travel, much, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that's always so, my win. Is okay. Paid for so travel. We, you know, we work hard as scientists, and, you know, a lot of my days are writing grant proposals or reporting on the proposals that I do have. We're doing the work, you know, that we're right. funded for. But there are so many really wonderful perks um, when you're an earth scientist and a paleontologist, and I do love to travel. So I will right. take it, you know, take all that. So speaking of what you love outside of science, you mm-hmm. love to travel. What mm-hmm. else do you love to do? Well, I love sports. So I'm from a family where the women love sports. <laughs> we love our football. So I'm usually in a football pool okay. um, in the spring. I do, you know, NC2A basketball pools. I like going to <laughs> live games. So I grew up as a Niner fan. But a lot of but. my female friends that love football or Raider fans, so yep. it's all about the Raiders. That's for, right. Now that, you know, now Raiders they're are leaving. back in the, yeah, right. well, that too. So I'm all about Bay Area sports teams. So love me some Warriors, <laughs> of course, root for the A's and Giants. So yeah, I really do follow professional sports and college sports as well. And now working at Berkeley, where you know we're Division right. One, go Bears. So I go to football, <laughs> basketball games. So yeah, so definitely sports. And you know, I just love to be outside. So whether it's walking in the city in my neighborhood or going on hikes, um. Love music too. Mm-hmm. Tower of Power's my group. The area girl. <laughs> Earth Wind Fire too. So yeah, going to hear live music. Mm-hmm. And just getting together with friends. You know, I work hard and do travel a lot. So when I am home, I yeah. make sure I connect with friends and just have a good time. You know. Right. That's it. That's it. Yeah. So if you ever were like looking for Lisa, probably in the uh, fall, you're going to yeah. see her at Tailgate. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah! If you follow me, right? Yeah, Twitter, you will see her like on Raider yeah. tailgate. But now I don't know. I'm not going to travel all the way to Vegas for them anytime soon. So now I'm yeah. just back to my roots, you know, with the Niners and everything. Still got to travel. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I, but you know, <laughs> I am happy on a weekend in the fall. Yeah, tailgating, just figuring out, you know, my Saturdays watching college ball, yeah, and going to games. So it's very fun. It's oh, a yeah. great way to. Just, you know, focus yeah. on things you love. So. I don't see myself going to Vegas very often for a game. Right. I know for sure mm-hmm. I'm not buying any jerseys or any paraphernalia okay. that says Vegas Raiders. Oh, no. no. I refuse it's just wrong. to buy that. See, when they were in L.A., it just was kind of, mm, yeah. I don't know. Not buying that, but right. I will always rock my Oakland you Raider will. gear. There you go. And, you know, yeah. y'all want to do that, whatever. Right. But um, but I know it's very strange that very strange. You know, I don't see it going that, very well. Well, I know what you mean. I mean, people will definitely you know go make a weekend of it and go to game. But I don't know. It's just so well, I don't see it going well yeah. because you you're taking a lot of eighteen to twenty five year olds to the city of sin. 
where prostitution is legal. <laughs> and, you know, I'm sure getting, I don't want to say drugs, but, you know, just getting whatever you need is out there for the taking. So, yeah, and we'll instant see. millionaire. Right. Instant 18 right. to 25 year old I'm millionaire. I'm telling my bear friend, just come with me a niner. You know, I feel like I'm going back to my roots, you know, my childhood roots. I even uh, bought, I was <laughs> like, oh, my niner gear is kind of old. You know, I need to just up my game. So it's been fun. So you got some new gear. I got some new gear. Actually, there's a store in Stonestown in San Francisco called The Spot. And it's local artists that um, have just wonderful art from paintings to T-shirts, a lot of silk screening. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's very Bay Area-based, SF-based. So I bought a really nice... um, San Francisco, you know, Niner vest, and they have like okay. lots of cool. They got Raider stuff in there too. So. Okay, well, then maybe, I'll, maybe I'll go. Right. Spot, right. <laughs> so Steve said Tower of Power has the tightest horn section in the Woo! history of the world. Of course. So I think my first Tower of Power concert, you know, showing my age and everything, but it was like '75 at Keysar Stadium in San Francisco. Okay. The Snap concert. It was like Save Your School kind of thing. Uh-huh. So I have two older sisters that were very much into music and. Um, many of the guys at our high school played in bands, and we just loved Tower of Power. I mean, we loved all the Bay Area bands, from Santana mm-hmm. to Sly and the Family Stone to War. But, yep, um, Tower of Power is my group. Actually, I was messaging a friend today because, there, you know, there's there's always a lot of T.O.P. shows in the Bay Area, and then there's a gap. They travel overseas. But there's going to be a show um, in Napa in uh, April or March, yeah, March okay. yeah, for T.O.P. And I haven't seen them for like three or four months. And that's a long time for me. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I go to the show. I'm like, oh, it's time. I right. Tower power. But yeah, Titus Horn section. And, you know, they've done backup, the horn section with other bands and everything. And, okay. Yeah, so that's, you know, showing my barrier roots. Yeah, <laughs> oh, it's Graham Central Station played at yes. Snack. Yeah. Oh. yeah, he was. I guess you was there, Steve. Oh, Were yeah. you there? Must have been there. Yeah, there. yeah. You know what? So some somewhere, you know, in the like Twitter verse, yeah, someone has posted like the actual ticket. Yeah, like, snap concert and everything. Oh, wow. And yeah, and if you Google, I mean, there are a couple of historical photographs that I think the Chronicle has. Okay. It was only five dollars, if you can believe it, for like a, a dozen concert. bands oh, all dozen. day. Oh wow! And my family, I, I don't believe it. I grew <laughs> up in the in the <laughs> avenues near Golden Gate Park, so we just walked, you know, to Keysar. Wow. Eighth and Colton, where we live, so. Memories. Yeah. You know, that's why I need to like do my walking tours. Yes. Do, like, historical you do. SF stuff so I can tell all those side stories. You right. Know. You do. What about um, yeah. photography? Right. Well, so people often ask me that too. Like, mm-hmm. do I still keep up photography? And it's certainly easier to do now with digital photography and, mm-hmm. you know, great cameras on cell phones. So I don't do as much as I'd like to. But actually, this year, uh, a friend gave me like a journaling book. And she said, you know, you really should document your trips more. And so I thought, maybe I will this year. Like, yes. get photographs and just kind of get back to that. Because, mm-hmm. you know, I try to remember where I was last year or whatever. <laughs> it's like, and, you know, I have some distinctive memories and, you know, right. all the shared photos we do on Facebook or whatever help me remember. But I'm thinking this year to be more deliberative about photographing and sharing it. Yeah, I went to a um, free... DSLR class, Ooh. and I don't have a camera, so well, I just wanted to go yeah, and see what it was like. What, yeah, and, uh, and I was like, oh, okay, mm-hmm. I, I learned a little bit, a lot more about DSLR, DSLR oh, yeah. cameras, DSLR. and I was like, one of these days I'll probably right. invest into it because right. that's my whole goal is sure. to show, show what people are doing in STEM into it. Oh yeah, be like, look, these and are I, all these things. So when I majored in photography, it's very much the old school. Like we were trained in black and white you know, photography <laughs> and development. I'm like, oh, I probably have brain damage from all those chemicals <laughs> and the black and white um, developing process. Yeah, As you know, you'd be in dark rooms and all the crazy, you know, chemicals you had to yeah. use to process. But it, you know, it was great training, and you really had to look in detail at your images, you know, in sharpness mm-hmm. and everything. So I'm like, oh, I don't want to be one of those people that say, they don't know how good they have it. So right. Like, no, I wasn't sure what my image was going to look like <laughs> until I printed the darn thing. And See, I wasn't, like, 
in photography yes. like that, but it reminds right. me of disposable cameras. Well, I don't even know if yeah. those exist anymore. No, but um, but something that's been making kind of a comeback are you know the Polaroid, mm-hmm. with, yeah, like with the, the Insta- Polaroid, because Insta- yeah. Insta- those are fun, you know. Because right. sometimes people want to print rather than a digital copy to right. see, though. There's, so there's some fun versions of Insta. Okay, yeah. Those. Mel says what goes on a tour stays on a tour. So whatever goes oh, yes. on on your walking tour, there you go. Stays exactly. on the walking tour. Right, oh, right. Good. Yeah, because yeah. I we didn't tell you what all went on in New Zealand. I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> been a lot. But it was a good lot. times. Mm-hmm. Right. We had a great time, and you did. You and know, we're still connected. Yeah, you know, with so many people that we've met, we're working with, or get right. advice from. Because I saw Mel um, last fall in Brisbane. Mm-hmm. I was there for the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting. And we did a workshop the day before the conference started. So Mel came and she brought so many amazing examples of how they share materials, you know, yeah. in the museum. So yeah, shout out to Mel. We love you and we look forward to an opportunity to work together. I'm trying to get Mel on my podcast. I know. Because you can do it. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm trying yeah. to tell Mel and her friends at I the know. Sydney oh, Museum. Yeah. She's, yeah. Great just waiting on her, right. but the, the yeah. museum is closed right now. It is it's under res- in there, um, I know. renovations, so when they, right? And then the fires. So yes, I get it. But but she'll we'll, be on. Yes, so we'll be waiting. Yeah. Yes. But um, outside of that, like, mm-hmm. I do want to encourage people to right. look into School of Rock. Mm-hmm. You know, especially if you're an educator, right? To look into it and oh, to right. make apply. Mm-hmm. You know, they need people to apply from diverse backgrounds mm-hmm. and then also um um stem, stem seeds. seeds stem seeds which is for students and right. graduate students if you primarily. if you know undergrad students or you are undergrad students who are in science or want to learn mm-hmm. more about oceanography or the ocean right. sciences or earth science right to apply for stem seeds and no matter the student major their discipline it's such a great experience for really any STEM student or even non-STEM student. Uh-huh. You know, one of the grants I have that's connected with STEM C's is we really try to focus on students that might be more interested in science communication. I mean, we right. want to have the next cat that, you know, wants right. to just <laughs> elevate understanding of science by doing shows like this. And what better way to right. increase, like, your own vocabulary of science and not, than to just be immersed you know, in an ocean science setting. So they're really great opportunities. Right. There was a student on those STEM seeds I went on, which was a trip to Alaska. Mm-hmm. Um, her name's Katie Jo. And her, mm-hmm. her uh, major was communications. And she wanted to learn more about science communication. But her major wasn't under science. But she was there. So right. I encourage people to apply yep. to these programs. There's mm-hmm. so many. And right. if you follow Lisa or I on mm-hmm. social media, we try to share some of these op- opportunities that's out there that needs more diverse students to apply. Absolutely. Right. Because we want to see you there. I mean, right. trip to New Zealand. I mean, I don't know when they're going back to New Zealand. So don't hate on I my art trip. But sh- right. I'm just saying. That was amazing. You know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Mel said we need to, in- we're inspiring science for the future generations. Yes, we Exactly. Are. We want All them to. Mm-hmm. Be like my cousin Greg. Get that microscope, there you, you know, go. and just look at the frog and, the and everything right. else. You never know what it's going to lead to. You so. never know. Mm-hmm. You never know. It's always an open door right. to so many possibilities. Or if you're in school and you're a photography major, That's maybe true. taking a science class just to see. Yeah. Right. You know, a lot of people think science is just hard, but... Or that it's, yeah, or you're tied to a lab bench, or right. you crunch numbers. Right. I'm like, no. We go outside, we travel, we work across disciplines, we're trying to answer, you know, like, fundamental questions about right. how the earth and the environment operate. So, it's like, exactly. join us. Right. Mm-hmm. So, uh, is there any last thing that you want to add that we have talked about tonight? Um, well, we definitely covered the range. And thank you for having me. Of and course. just appreciate just a relaxed opportunity, you know, to chat about what we do and mm-hmm. the things I'm passionate about. And, you know, as you mentioned, just, you know, follow us on social media mm-hmm. so people can find out about programs that we have. Um, and, yeah, just be open to opportunities to learn about That's our science, it. paleontology. And we're just a great network of people that love what we do and 
and there's lots of great opportunities in the field. So that's what I always like to leave people with. You know, it's a great discipline, even if you didn't or don't have that much exposure to it. You know, as a student, it's really a great field, and there are a lot of really terrific programs across the country to right. study it. Right, mm-hmm. and there's so many opportunities. Right. But like you said, it's just being open, you know? Right. I'm not a fashionista, and I'm not a big <laughs> art person. <laughs> But I'll go to an art oh, museum yeah. or I'll go and learn right. something about it because right. it's something I don't know and right. I'm open to it. So being open yeah. to STEM, science, tech, engineering, math, mm-hmm. I mean, you love your phone, you might as well learn about it, you know. <laughs> but just being open is Absolutely. always the bottom line. Right. So I want to thank you. And You're how can people good. find you on social okay. media? So um, they can find me. Through well, my email through Berkeley is ldwide at berkeley.edu, but um, my Twitter handle actually Lisa to a fault. So a friend gave me that handle. Like, gotta do something, you know, geological. Some geological. Yeah. yeah. So it's Lisa to a fault on both Twitter and Instagram, and then on Facebook, yeah, just Lisa White at Berkeley. You can search me and find me, and uh, yeah. Okay. I got like a bunch of science things at my house so i'm gonna leave you guys with this lisa's tag is lisa to a fault if you can tell me if you're not a geolo- geology person male if you can tell me what the fault means in geology maybe i'll send you something that's science related you know something nerdy but tell me why the fault is geological inspired okay so thank you guys for joining us tonight thank, thank you lisa you. for being a part my of it my pleasure yes. we're gonna keep Enjoy on drinking our wine oh, yeah. and talk to you guys <laughs> later <laughs> good night everybody Bye. thanks everyone for tuning in <laughs>